welcome to Joy on Paper Live, a program for writers and those who dream of writing, and for everyone who wants to know the story behind the book. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I have a wonderful story behind the book that we are going to be talking about today. And my guests are Neve McNally and Gary Krieger. That's a beautiful picture of them. There they are. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Yes. Well, it's so nice to see you. I was so excited when I got the book. This is my kind of book. I've been on lots of adventures myself, but never quite like yours. First of all, the book is great, but your life story is great. We're going to be talking about this wonderful book. But first, we have to find out something about you. How did you get to this place where you got to meet two wonderful people? Well, and exciting men who decided to cross the Atlantic in a rowboat. I mean, for me, that's like, I can't believe it. I still can't believe it. I read this book. I, I stopped. I started. I said, what? What? And I went back and I looked at things. And it's true. They really did. And you are going to tell us all about it. First, let's hear a little bit about yourselves. Okay. Thank you, Patsy. Thanks. It's lovely to join you. So I'm obviously Neve, and the other guy over there is Gary. <laughs> I had come to Crewe on a sailboat for one month to help Gary bring his boat from Florida to the Bahamas as a volunteer crew. And as life would have it, living on a 40-foot sailboat for 24 hours a day with no cell phone, no internet, or no TV, you only have to do is work and talk. So we got to know each other from the inside out. And the short version of our story is we continued to live on that boat for six years. As Gary would say, he couldn't get rid of me, right? <laughs> Patsy, she was supposed to come for one month. And here we are eight years later. Wow. Oh. Bl blissfully married. The, so the I have to ask you. So what did you think of her when you first saw her? Did you say, I'm going to keep her on this boat forever. <laughs> no, it didn't actually work that way. <laughs> we we kind of grew to like each other over time, but uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't love at first sight. It was respect, mutual respect. And I had uh, looked at a lot of resumes of people who wanted to join me. Uh, and she had a stellar resume with lots of sea work. And uh, it, it was very impressive. So I asked her to join me. Well, it's a good thing. <laughs> yes, and the the f funny thing is, when I when I agreed to go and volunteer for him, my family immediately said, "You're going to go to sea with somebody you have never met. How do you know he's not an axe murderer?" <laughs> and, and his family said, "Yeah, well, it was my friends who are sailors. They wanted to check Neif out when she got there. Uh, they said, "How do you know she's not a modern day pirate?" <laughs> So, anyway, so we, we trusted our instincts and we set sail. So spool forward a number of years at the beginning of 2020, February of 2020, we were in Antigua sitting in the cockpit, having a late lunch. And I say a late lunch because Gary Krieger likes to get up the crack of noon. But um, anyway, so we're having a lunch. And then the next thing we heard people say, oh, they're coming. And we went, well, who's coming? And they said, two men who have just rowed ashore 3,000 nautical miles all the way from the Canary Islands to Antigua as part of this race, the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. And we said, oh, we've got to go see this because we had spent about 10 days at sea in the Atlantic ourselves in actually awful conditions. So I wasn't exactly about to repeat it. The idea that these two men had done this. So Gary said, well, let's jump in the dinghy. We'll go out to the finishing line right between the red and the green marker buoys and see if we can see them coming in. So we took the cameras. I started taking photographs as I could see the little dot appearing on the horizon. And then when they crossed the finish line, all of the ship's bells and the hooters and everybody was just applauding. It was like a cacophony of sounds. And I started taking pictures and then I got this one picture of the moment they stood up like their Olympic podium moment and held their flares up, which as you can see from the front cover of the book, that became the front cover. Wow. And of course, then the book came along. So do you want me to show the promo that you've done for the book? Sure. Okay, let's look at that because that's a great one. And 
And there, there you have it. There it so is. that's now in that photograph there, what you're seeing is this is in Lago Mare in the Canary Islands. And this is the start of the race. So this is their first couple of pulls uh, into the race. And the next picture you'll see was taken from the opposite side which will show the distance of how far they had to travel. That's the photograph that says 3,000 nautical miles to go. Now, who named the book the Didi? Dream it, do it. The boat originally was built by a gentleman called Roger Haynes. And back in the days, it was called the Woodvale Challenge. And you had to build the boat yourself and then row it across the ocean. And he was the gentleman who named it Didi, Dream It, Do It. And believe it or not, this was the fourth time when Paul and Phil took this boat across. This was the fourth time the boat had made this voyage and never once capsized. Uh, uh, how many feet is it exactly? I don't remember. It's a, it's about 20 foot long. 20 feet. No. And yes, at about six feet beam. So uh, on the picture you're looking at at the moment, you can see the two of them rowing at the same time. That's the only time really that they rowed together. Normally the picture, at the right of the picture, you will see a cabin with what looks like a solar panel on top. That is the sleeping quarters. So usually one of them was either in there resting or working with the nav comms or preparing the food and the other person was rowing by themselves. But 20 feet, can you imagine in 30 foot seas? (laughs) Both the size of my bathroom. (laughs) Yeah. It just still boggles my mind that they did this. Uh, And it, repeat the number of uh, of days. So they left on the 12th of December in 2019 and they arrived in Antigua at 5 30 in the evening on the 20th of february 2020 so they were at sea in that boat for 70 days nine hours and 11 minutes and they celebrated christmas and new year's eve absolutely (laughs) without friends or family just the two of them on the boat oh wow wow when they got to this point (laughs) what did they do yeah, that was them starting off at that beginning where they've got 3,000 miles to go. It's like, okay, we're ready to do this. <laughs> that was just the beginning. Oh, well, we're going to talk about each of them individually because I think they're amazing. I love I love it. And so here is when, <laughs> when you first saw them. And it must have been exciting, really exciting, when you realized what you were seeing. Right. I... Was, we took the camera out to the finishing line and Gary kept asking me, well, can you see them? Can you see them? And I could just literally see a dot on the, on the horizon. And once they came through that, then I got to see the pictures themselves. And I don't know if you've got the next picture there, Pat. enjoy hearing the story of these guys so let's hear about how they wake up one morning and say oh gee i want to get in a rowboat and (laughs) (laughs) not quite so if you look at this picture here now this is paul hopkins this is actually the same person the image on the left is paul the day he started and the image on the right is what it was like what he looked like after being at sea for 70 days Now, how this all started was Paul was a firefighter in England. He was about 52 years of age at the time, and he suffered a brain hemorrhage. And luckily, thank God, he survived it. And at the end of that kind of period of recovery, he said, you know what? I need to do something really big with my life now that I have a second chance at life. And all through his early years, he had been ridiculed because he actually suffered from dyslexia. And there wasn't a lot understood about it at the time of school. So people thought he was an idiot. They called him stupid and thick. And so Paul decided, this is my moment. I am now going to show and prove to everybody I know 
I can amount to something. I am going to achieve something. So he found out about this race to row across the Atlantic and he thought, I'm going to do that. And guess what? He had never rowed a boat in his life before. So he was starting from scratch. <laughs> and of all the things that you think, well, I want to show people. Now, <laughs> yeah, I love rowing a boat and I was doing it. I was born on Lake Superior. It was natural for me I, rowing from the age of like the minute my dad could get me in the boat. He let me hold on to the oar. I, it's, I just can't imagine it. I know. And then if we go forward to the next picture, you'll see we have Phil, who because Paul needed a, a partner, obviously, to help row the boat with them. This is Phil Pugh. And again, this is him on the left and on the right after the row when they came ashore. So Phil was always an adventurer. He did a lot of different things. He had kayaked across the Gibraltar Straits. He had cycled Route 66. And one of the, excuse me, one of the um, driving forces for Phil was his son, Tom, was born with cerebral palsy. And at about two months old, excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me, um, he was starting to fail and they thought they were going to lose him. And Phil made a bargain with God that night. And he said, please, God, let my son live. If you let him live, I promise I will do everything in my power to take care of him for the rest of his life. I'll stay fit. I'll stay healthy. And at the age of 60, uh, Phil decided, I'm going to do a major challenge every year. And he had done four up to that point. So at age 65, he agrees to row this boat with Paul. And the two of them hadn't even met before. It was a mutual acquaintance who put them together. So both being, what I find fascinating in the story is both of them are very much alpha males. And for them to come together and figure out how to make that work and how to work together as a team was extraordinary. Did they understand it was the Atlantic Ocean? I mean, <laughs> did, did, it, did they ever think, you know, so many big boats have been lost. All of the explorers who came, you know, we know Christopher Columbus made it, but a lot of other ones never made it. And they had much bigger boats. Uh, absolutely. Now, the good thing is at the time, the um, races run by Al oh, sorry, Atlantic campaigns it used to be called the Tawaskawistic Atlantic Challenge. At this point, it's now called the world's toughest row. They put in some very stringent safety precautions. The boys had to go through a lot of sea safety tests. They had to row the boat overnight in, in preparation. They did a lot of the training on the North Sea in England. But they still, they said, even none of that really compared to what it was like out in the Atlantic. And one of the things Paul was really looking forward to was getting out of the sight of land in the night and seeing that night sky with absolutely no light pollution. And he said that was one of the most moving moments of his life as well. Yeah, but you could do that on land somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. But to do I, uh, on the ocean as you're going up and down. Up and down. <laughs> yeah, and God loved them. In the very beginning, the first seven days or so, they were both very, very seasick. Um, the, there's a lot of currents and waves and weather conditions right around the islands of the Canaries. So before they broke free of that, they really did have a horrible storm. Both of them, they had to put out what's called a para anchor. So it's like a parachute underwater to try and keep the boat into the waves. And the two of them had to cram into that tiny little cabin. And they lived through that for at least 24 hours and lots of equipment broke. And they wondered at one point, should they turn back? But they kept going. And, and at one point, Phil said to Paul, you know, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Should we back? And Paul turns around to him and he says, this boat is going to Antigua. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it did. It certainly and did. And it did. Yes, and, yes. And then you get, I mean, Antigua, you know, you, you see it. It's so calm. It's so beautiful. And you think, oh, well, I could have taken a plane there. Exactly. And this is a beautiful picture of actual Nelson's dockyard in Antigua where they come ashore. And... Once they were ashore and they were greeted by the race officials and some people who were on shore to greet them, then every, the crowds disappeared and they were kind of left by themselves. So Gary and I went over and started chatting with them and Gary showed them the picture of the, the, that picture we looked at that I had taken of them with our flares up. And 
Paul was so moved and by the, the picture itself, he just choked up. He said, you know what? That sums up not just the 70 days at sea, but the entire four year struggle of everything we had to do to get to the starting line. And we started to talk a little bit about their story. We said, hey guys, why don't you come onto our sailboat tomorrow night for your first home cooked meal and let's talk some more. So this picture you're looking at now is them all cleaned up and ready to go the next night and myself and Gary, and that's our boat freed spirit that we lived on for the six years. And so they came ashore, came onto our boat, and we started talking about the idea of my writing their story. And so now uh, tell a little bit about your background, because uh, I mean, it's nice to have the idea to to write a book, but uh, wow. Well, to do it. And then next thing you know, you're. (laughs) you're I mean, that's. Right. So, so as I mentioned earlier, I've been a television director. It was probably my first job as an actress and then a television director. I grew up um, the daughter of two well-known Irish actors, Ray McAnally and my mother, Ronnie Masterson. And my dad, Ray, had been in a movie called The Mission with Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons. And as it happened, I had just finished working a, an internship at the National Theatre in London with Sir Peter Hall and I was free. And my dad said to me, do you want to come to South America with me? We we're about to film this mission down by the Iguazu waterfalls and in Colombia and Cartagena. And I said, absolutely. And when I got there, the producers, David Putnam and Rowan Joffe was the director, invited me to be on the stunt team because I had a big background in adventure sports and um, canoeing and a bit of rock climbing, etc. So I joined the, st- uh, the stunt team as the stunt assistant. And obviously I got to know Jeremy Irons at that point. So spool forward years later, I was writing my memoir and I gave it to him to read and he was going to write, write the forward for it. And then as it turned out, this book flares up, got picked up first. And Jeremy is a very big sailor as well. And so he was very enamored by the story. And he said, yes, he'd write the forward. And then he came and he joined us in Dublin, Ireland for the big launch. And that's the pair of us on stage the day we launched the book. Oh, it's it's a great shot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and of course, he did the forward and he also for the audible, too. That's right. He narrates the forward on the audible and he has such an amazing voice. Anybody who's ever listened to Jeremy Irons is just like, it will make you melt. And and as far as, far as I'm concerned, it's worth listening to the audiobook just even to hear him read the forward. Um, and then yours truly, I actually narrate the rest of the story on the audiobook. And uh, it's, it's good. Nowadays, a lot of people are listening to books and like you know yourself, podcasts, people are listening on the go. Um, if they don't have time to sit down and read a book itself, you know, so it's, it's a good listen. You've done a beautiful job of narration. Really fantastic. It's, oh. but thank you very much. It's emotionally, I, I like reading my own work because I, I'm connected to the emotion. And as I write, I actually write in my head and I write in, in scenes. I write visually, if you know what I mean. And I kind of read it out in my mind. So when it comes time to do the narration, I know what I, what the emotion is I'm looking for and what it's going to sound like. So I th- with this, I felt so connected to the story itself and having met the gentlemen themselves, you know? Yeah. Oh, it, it comes through. It comes through. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, it's just wonderful. <laughs> wonderful to get to be with Jeremy Irons. An amazing human being who, as you know, I've admired and followed his career over the years. And for him to support mine at this stage in my writing career, it was just uh, so gracious and so kind of him to spend time with me doing that. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. (laughs) I think you're going to get another forward next time. But, you know, the wonderful thing about you with your background as an actress and coming from a film family, a actor family. I'm sure that we're going to be seeing um, a, a movie out of this book because it's exciting. Well, wouldn't that be lovely? It would. I think. I think the story would make a wonderful movie. And one of the things about the story, this is what I, I said to Paul and Phil at the time we we sat on the boat. I said, "Look, the story of rowing across an ocean in and of itself as an adventure is fantastic. It's a great achievement." But really, not everybody in the world is going to do that. They're not all going to climb Mount Everest. But really what the message of your story is that you can achieve any goal you set yourself. 
And my message in, in conveying your story is I want you to dig deep emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and share with us why you did it, how it affected your families, and how in months to come, the experience changed you as human beings. And I think that's the real message of the story. And again, with the name of the boat, Dream It, Do It, that is telling us that it doesn't matter how small or how large a goal we set ourselves, we can all push ourselves and achieve whatever it is we want and create the greatest life we want to live. Well, it is inspiring. Absolutely. People will sit around and they'll say, you know, I want to do something. <laughs> they talk about a bucket list. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just love it. I love this story. And like you, I can see the film in my head. I can yes. see, I, I would just love to see this. The two actors who get the, this roles, they're going to be ha happy actors, I think. <laughs> Indeed. So what do we have here? It, the book led, <laughs> led to some other great things. Hi, back, Can I, back uh, Gary. Can I jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I will tell you that, that Neif was nominated for uh, an award in London. It was the, the Sunday Times of London, and it was the Vicki Orvis Award for her writing. And we were so thrilled to get the honor. Um, she did a, such a great job, and it's nice to have been recognized. Uh, so we flew to London for, for actually 48 hours. Um, it was a very quick turnaround. Uh, but there we are in that photo at the red carpet, uh, although it's blue in this case, uh, <laughs> during the, the awards banquet. And uh, it was lovely to be with all of the amazing people, the writers and the publishers that were there. Uh, and I'm so proud of Nia. It's such a great book. Well, it, it is. And I'm thinking, well, now, how big is your boat compared to this rowboat? So our boat is is uh, 40 feet long. Uh, oh, it's twice as big. Rig, twice as big. It's a cutter rig sloop uh, for any of the sailors out there. And um, uh, it's a, a blue water boat. So you know there are there are boats that are day boats there are boats that are coastal cruisers and there are boats that are blue water boats um and the the difference is really just how strongly they're built and and what their purpose for um when i got the boat i wanted to have something that would take good care of me and anybody else with me in this case neif uh turned out to be my long-term partner uh and so it was uh, it was uh a caliber 40 cutter rigged sloop. It was interesting because when we were on the boat, Neif showed me a short story that she had written early on. Uh, we probably had been together on the boat for a month or six weeks at that point. And the story was so incredible that she had written. I was very moved and I said, you have got to pursue this. You are such a good writer. And that's, uh, that, I think, was the beginning of her falling into the idea that she was the writer on the water. Well, it's a perfect title. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, tell me, with, with all this time that you spend in, in close company with her, um, who does the cooking on the boat? Who does most of the cooking? <laughs> oh, well, very good question. Neif actually did most of the cooking on the boat. I had a barbecue on the boat, which I expected to use, and she was very concerned about uh, the barbecue catching fire or causing a problem with the canvas on the boat catching fire. So uh, uh, I didn't do much barbecuing, and she did most of the cooking. <laughs> I did occasionally cook, but, but she was the main cook. I was yeah, we her up. <laughs> we, we don't. We divided up between us, uh, Patsy. So I, I did a lot of the work on the deck, you know, I, I, with the sails, and Gary did a lot of all the helm work. We worked together very well as a team. And it's interesting because you see people coming into an anchorage and they're shouting and yelling at each other, trying to find the right place to drop the anchor or to tie up to a mooring ball. And uh, Gary and I developed this hand signal system so I could give him a hand signal and, and et cetera to guide him as he's driving the boat. And then later on, somebody introduced us to what they call 
the marriage savers, which are actually Bluetooth um, headsets. So he would be on the helm and I would be on the bottom. We could talk gently to each other. Okay, one, another foot to your port side, another foot. Okay, I'm coming up on the morning ball. Okay, and we always looked so professional as a result, you know, uh, it was wonderful. The difference between hand signals and actually having the ability to talk to each other without screaming and shouting across 40 feet uh, was incredible. Uh, and they really made a big difference in, in how we looked in terms of being professional on the water. Are you still on the water? Or are you a little, little bit more on land? Well, we were... Um, we were in Antigua and we decided it was time to bring the boat home after COVID. Uh, so we actually moved back to land the, and now we live in a house. Yeah. <laughs> but we're still on the water. We have a home on the water. We've got a new boat now, which is not one we live on. And so one of the things that COVID did give us in terms of a gift was when we came ashore, we went, oh, here's a machine that washes your dishes. Here's an oven that cooks to temperature. <laughs> Here's a door you can close and be away from the other person for more than 30 seconds, you know? So we now have the best of both worlds. We have a boat right here on our dock, right out the back of our house here. We're in Punta Gorda, Florida, which is on a canal system. We've got that beautiful water out on the Gulf of Mexico. So we have the best of both worlds. And, uh, and also I'm still writing all the time. So I'm still the writer on the water. And uh, we're getting ready, actually, in September. I think we talked about it on your radio show. We're getting ready in September to bring out our next book, which is Following Sunshine, a voyage around the mind, around the world, around the heart, which will tell a little bit more about my memoir and also the story of what really happened when I came onto that sailboat and we lived happily ever after. Well, it's a, it's a great story, Patsy. And, and if I can just... Uh, tell your audience, uh, if anybody wants to follow, please uh, go to Neif's website, which is thewriteronthewater.com. And um, you can sign up for email updates. Uh, you'll get notifications when the book is going to be released and where it's going to uh, be launched. So uh, please go to the website and sign up and keep in touch with, with us and Lots of interesting, interesting information uh, will be there. Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. And wow, I think you're both so amazing. What you've done, uh, living a life of adventure. People need to enjoy life more. And I think you've certainly found a way to do it. Part of it, of course, is uh, being a writer. When you write a book and you share that joy, and that's why I named my program Joy on Paper, uh, so that people would find the joy of reading and the reading of adventure. I want to thank you so much for joining me today because I think the story is wonderful. I think the guys are wonderful. It's just every time I look at the the photo of of this moment right here, very happy you've joined me today and here are the guys again and i'm sure that uh, they will like to see themselves on uh, on the big screen one day absolutely thank you so much yes it's a it's a wonderful story a story that say with all of us for the rest of our lives i'm sure well paul hopkins and phil pew they're they're two men to be admired and they are very very inspirational their stories inspirational and what you've done with it and taken it to, to a new level. And I think we're going to get a, even a bigger level. What you have to do is you have to promise when you get a, a film deal to come on, <laughs> on Joy on Paper Live and tell me about it. Well, Patsy, from your lips to Hollywood's ears. That's right. Well, we're, we're going we're gonna to be working on Hollywood. That's part of why I started this. I did nine years on the radio and I've interviewed mm -hmm. so many people, well, thousands. And one of the reasons I decided to do a YouTube channel is that I wanted people to actually see the authors, to realize what they put into it, the passion they put mm -hmm. into it, and the joy they put into it, and to be influenced by that. And also, um, I am going to be sending a lot of links to people in Hollywood because we need new material. 
I always say to people, anybody in Hollywood, I say, please don't make another remake of Little Women. Please don't make, <laughs> if, if I see one more remake of Pride and Prejudice, I'll go crazy. We need exciting stories. We need inspirational stories. And this flares up. It is really a story bigger than the Atlantic. I, I get such a kick out of it. It's a factual book, but it's, it reads like a novel. And that is so <laughs> much fun. Uh, it's always difficult when you're writing a story where you know the outcome. I mean, we know they're going to make it across the ocean. But what goes into that? And then what's waiting for them at the other side? Uh, all of that, you created this wonderful novel style of writing that is fantastic. Yeah, and thank you for that, Patsy, because one of the things I learned in one of my early writing classes was to explain the difference between surprise and suspense. And um, I have written this book in terms of suspense because a surprise is, oh, do we know if they're going to cross and get to the finish, yes or no? Well, obviously, the front cover tells you, yes, they're going to get there. So there's no surprise to that. But what the suspense is, is how they get there. And that's the journey, you know, and that's the kind of stuff I like to share. And like you, I mean, you're a great encourager for so many writers. And I personally believe we all have a story to tell. And now actually I run writers workshops for that reason to encourage emerging talent and, you know, mining people's memories and, and getting it out on paper. And whether it's just for one's own self to work through a process, whether it's something that you want to pass on to your families, like like family lore for the grandchildren, the great grandchildren years to come, or whether it's something like this, a story that needs to be told and needs to be shared because of its inspiration. And then you want to share it with the world. And I think every one of us deep down, I always say in the classes, if you can write a grocery list, you can write a book. Oh, that's great. Now, I still want to talk to Gary a little bit. Because Gary, <laughs> I just want to know, when, when you were on the boat all the time, um, why, who was the most talkative? Were you the one always talking? Who was the, <laughs> the talker in the family? Uh, that, that's funny. Um, you know, Nia f probably talked more than I do, but we shared an awful lot. We, we would, you know, there's... And the boat, there's no internet, there's no cell service, there's no television. Uh, and so what do you do in, in the evenings after you've anchored or if you're on a mooring ball? Um, you know, sometimes you're out uh, socializing with other boaters, but in, in the final analysis, you're back on your boat and it's just the two of you. Uh, and you sit around and you talk and you share and you tell stories. Um, and so that's how we got to know each other. We got to know each other very intimately as a result of sitting there and talking hour after hour, night after night, week after week. And it, uh, it really does make a difference. I mean, we were best of friends by the time uh, things move forward. And uh, it, that doesn't happen on land as often because there's so many distractions on land. So it was quite the deal for us to be able to experience that. As you mentioned, when the race finished and after the guys got on land and there they were sitting, did it surprise you? Uh, I mean, which one of you decided, let's invite them, let's, let's make contact because other people were just leaving them alone? Yeah, yeah, they were sitting there all by themselves. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable to me that after their 70 day journey, uh, they went through the, the short ceremony on the platform where they got all the accolades and pictures taken and people applauding them. And then here they are 20 minutes later, sitting in the middle of a, of a grassy lawn, uh, eating dinner, uh, and nobody, nobody bothered to come over and say hello to them. So I decided to go over and, uh, Neif and I walked over and, and started chit-chatting with them, and they were delighted. They were delighted to have some company, and that's that's how you know the conversation started. Sure. Uh, I think Neif said, "Let's let's have them over for dinner the following night," and we did. Uh, we invited them, and and they uh, they were thrilled to have the opportunity. As a matter of fact, I don't know if Neif 
has told that story. Um, but Paul told us later that he, he uh, uh, called his wife that night and he said, guess what? We've been invited on a super yacht for dinner. And <laughs> our response was, no, no, you don't understand. We're a 40 foot sailboat look around the dockyard here in the marina, there are super yachts, 150 foot, 200 foot boats that are, you know, absolutely what the category of super yacht is. Multi-million dollar ones. <laughs> exactly. And Paul said, no, you don't understand. We've been on a 20 foot rowboat. This is a super yacht to us. <laughs> so they, they had a wonderful time on board our boat. Well, it shows what kind of people you are. Very special people. You know, people like you who, who notice things and, and really have big hearts because that, that's what comes across. You know, and, and it's something actually to add there, uh, Patsy, we're asking Gary about, you know, talking on the boat and everything else like that. Um, I'm from Ireland. I might get excited about some things that irritate me, you know, just because it's in my genetics. And one of the things living together you have to understand is when you have a disagreement, you have got to fix it. There's no jumping in the car, going off to the gym or going to the pub or going to see your mates. There was one time we had a difficulty and it was all about docking the boat, which is probably the hardest part for all sailors. We docked the boat, wasn't feeling it. And uh, we had a little bit of a bumpy go and I got really upset and annoyed and I stormed off, right? I got as far as the bow 20 feet up and then I went, now what? <laughs> I've got to go fix this. I can't just ignore it, you know? And so we had to develop communication styles in order to rebalance and say, I love you very much. Yes, this was an issue. And then we worked through those and then we just said, okay, well, like that's what we called the first fix. Then afterwards, once everybody had calmed down and there was no emotional charge to the conversation, we were able to say, well, you know what? This is what you said and this is what, how it landed on me or this is what I was trying to communicate. And I think that's what saved us on the boat because a lot of people have asked us that question. How could you possibly live 24 seven inside a 40 foot space, you know? And similarly with Paul and Phil in Flares Up, they made that same uh, decision. In that case, they knew that only one person could be skipper, not both of them. And so Paul was skipper. And even though Phil quite capable of being skipper, they realized they had to work together like that. And they focused on not the problem, but the solution. That was their motto. I think that's what got them across the ocean as well. Well, did they take, did they take any music, any books? Any, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, they had um, they had music that they listened on Jawbone headphones, so they had their own set of music. I know Paul used to love listening to Queen, Queen's Greatest Hits. Um, as the journey progressed, they were getting what's called salt sores, which is um, they're they're you know they're sitting down, their bum is getting all wet, salty, and the friction, and their hands blistered and everything else like that. And and every time you go back on the oars. The first 10 minutes was just excruciating and you sort of play the music and get that through and to keep going and get into a rhythm, you know? Uh, well, people have to read this book. It, it, it is great. You've done a wonderful job and I'm just so very grateful for the time you spent with me today. Thank you so much. You are, you are to be admired and I am so proud uh, that you came on Joy on Paper Live because I've just started this program and I wanted something really exciting and boy, I got it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for having us, Patsy. Okay. Very bye. kind, Patsy. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Okay.
Well, what a joy to talk to Neve and to Gary. They are wonderful. And this book is great. Please get it. You'll love it. It's, it's fascinating. And read it now because I'm sure it will be a movie. And it's also available in Audible, as uh, Neve mentioned. And the introduction in the book and in the Audible is by Jeremy Irons. So if you enjoyed this interview and you enjoy all the interviews that I've been doing since I started Joy on Paper Live on St. Patrick's Day, nine years exactly after I started the radio program, uh, please join me and if uh, just join all the book lovers. Uh, I've been called the last of the red hot book lovers, but I don't want to be the last of the red hot book lovers. I want you to join me and be a red hot book lover too. So all you have to do is subscribe, like, comment, and share because that really will help me. Uh, I need <laughs> I need all the help I can get. I have over two thousand interviews that I want to put on my Patreon page. My Patreon page is free. You can see the. Um, radio interviews that I've started to put up. I've already put up some great ones, including one, oh, my, one of my favorites, Delia Efron. You have to listen to that one. That is on my Patreon page. It is absolutely free. It was one of the best, one, one hour long. I gave her the entire hour on the radio program because I could have talked to her for three hours straight. Uh, but do check out the Patreon page. As I said, it's free. Um, I'm going to put up a... Uh, a sort of a donation thing that you could do five dollars but five dollars is the limit I don't want to I never take money from authors publishers or publicists and I don't want to you know human nature being what it is uh, I could probably you know you tend to judge people by how much money they give you so I when I was thinking about it I would prefer to just charge five dollars you know, just as a donation, if you want, you don't have to give it to me. Uh, I I need it because when I have to edit 2,000 interviews so that I can put them up there. But the great thing about these interviews that I have, as you heard with this interview, you learn so much uh, from the authors, the story behind the book, but also the inspiration that went into it and the joy. And that's uh, exactly what I'm trying to do here. So please, uh, just help me by subscribing. I'm new to this whole YouTube thing. I didn't even, <laughs> when I started it, I didn't even know that, uh, you know, those little commercials they put in front of a YouTube thing, that they actually make money from them. I, I Somehow the whole concept was, was foreign to me. I don't know. I didn't know what they were doing. But anyway, all I can say is if, if you could just subscribe, like, comment, and share, because I understand everything is important, particularly, and I didn't realize it, the comments. But I like comments. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear if you have an author that you want me to invite. <laughs> Maybe I've already spoken to them. If not, I will invite them. And uh, just let me know. And I will select a few um, people who you know, submit a, a name. I will invite them to join me here on Joy on Paper Live because I love to talk to book lovers. So if you're a book lover, contact me. And my webpage is joyonpaperlive.com. And there's a list there of the upcoming, uh, you know, the guests that are coming up and also some of the other exciting things that I'm going to be doing on Joy on Paper Live, including uh, talking about, about the things that you need to know uh, about book publishing about books and of course my special very special uh, contributors who are helping me with all sorts of things Carolyn Howard Johnson is uh, she's the frugal book promoter she knows everything about book promotion and she's going to be joining me with doing special segments and so it's Devon Miller Devon Miller does the book buzzes for kids that's reviews two-minute promos and he's also a guest host he's been a guest host on the uh, radio program and he is going to be a guest host on joy on paper live as soon as he graduates in may oh my goodness it's so, so exciting he first came to to the radio program oh, many years ago <laughs> he was so young when he came and he had just finished um, a series of books called mr tickety talk clock books and i love those books they are so cute and you can 
find them online and you can buy them and order them because right now I'm going to do a little promo for children's hospitals and because children in hospitals need books. So I hope you'll listen to this uh, and get inspired and send some books to kids. You can just go online and have them sent directly, directly to the hospital of your choice. It doesn't take more than a few minutes and it will be most appreciated by all the children. And here are some of the children who love to read and I hope that you do too. And again, remember to please, please subscribe. I need, I need all the help I can get. And here we go. And just watch these kids enjoy reading.